Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products. Hello and welcome to In the Frame, Exploring the DIA. I'm Graham Beale, your guide to the Detroit Institute of Arts. Today we're going to be looking at the exhibition African American Art from the Walter O. Evans Collection. The exhibition is presented by the General Motors Center for African American Art, a curatorial department of the DIA. The DIA was one of the first major museums to establish a department dedicated to African American art. Today, I'm happy to say, I'm going to be joined by Walter O. Evans, the collector himself, and Valerie Mercer, curator of the General Motors Center for African American Art. I mentioned that the work of African American artists in the 19th century was indistinguishable from European art, and seen from a distance, this picture here could well be mistaken for a Barbizon school painting. The Barbizon artists were working in the forest of Fontainebleau um, earlier in the 19th century, and they were very, very popular with American collectors in the last couple of decades of the 19th century. But in fact, this picture was done by Edward Bannister, who lived and worked around Rhode Island. Um, so it, 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 is, it is, in fact, a very different landscape from the ones that were, were being made by the uh, by the Barbizon artists, and when you get up closer, you can see that the artist has also been absorbing lessons from the Impressionists, the much looser uh, brushwork, these much lighter tones in the foreground, and it also um, reminds me, anyway, of the work of George Innes, the, uh, the well-known romantic uh, 19th century painter. We're standing in front of uh, Flight of the Eagle by Robert Scott Duncanson. Robert Scott Duncanson is well known in the city of Detroit, having lived here on several of occasions. He was actually born in upstate New York, Seneca, New York, in 1821. He eventually traveled to Europe with uh, William Sontag, who was one of the most noted Hudson River School artists in the country. And on one of their return trips, William Sontag stayed in New York and Robert Scott Duncanson became one of the most popular Hudson River School artists in what was called the West at that time. Robert Scott Duncanson lived in Detroit and died in Detroit in 1871. Flight of the Eagle, painted in 1856, was done during Duncanson's best period. It is in the Hudson River School type uh, painting style, which is typically American. Uh, other members of the Hudson River School painting style are Frederick Church and William Sontag. This painting is in that typical style where nature is supreme. Nature uh, trumps mankind and uh, it is nature that is focused on so much in the Hudson River School style of painting. Henry O. Tanner was known as the dean of the African American artists, certainly of the 19th century artists. Having been born in Pittsburgh in 1859, he moved to Philadelphia when he was a teenager. One of the reasons he was known as the dean because of his extensive training at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts, which he attended from 1880 to 1882. He was the student of the able and inspiring taskmaster, Thomas Aikens. After completing his training in 1882, uh, he attempted to make a living as an artist, painting some of the seashores in uh, New Jersey and some of the scenes around Philadelphia. Unable to make a living with his painting in the Philadelphia area, Tanner moved to Atlanta, where he taught at Clock University and opened up a photography studio. Still unable to make a living uh, with his painting, he traveled to North Carolina where he took pictures uh, of the countryside where he might have gotten his material to paint the now famous banjo lesson. Tanner traveled then to Cincinnati uh, where he met 
the Reverend Herzl, uh, who provided him with the funds and means for him to travel to Rome, Florence, uh, and Paris. He did, however, become a major and instant success uh, with his paintings in, uh, in France. As a matter of fact, the French government bought one of his paintings, Daniel in the Lion's Den, for the museum, the Luxembourg Museum in Paris. Tanner caught typhoid fever and traveled back to the United States in 1893. It was in 1894 when he was attending a Methodist convention in Tallahassee, Florida, that he painted the painting that we see here now, Florida. Tanner's father was a bishop in the Methodist church and had a great deal of influence on his later work. Most of the work you find by Tanner is of religious subjects. When Tanner returned to France, he was again very, very successful, won many honors and awards. He married an American woman in France where he lived the rest of his life and died in 1937. While living in Paris, Tanner was a beacon for African-American scholars and artists. James Porter visited him there, as well as Alain Locke, Palma Hayden, and many other African-American artists uh, went to study and talk with Tanner. After World War I, Tanner was sort of a forgotten entity because the new lions were on the scene, such as Picasso and Braque and Matisse. Modernism had come into uh, play and Tanner really wasn't rediscovered, sort of, until many years after his death in 1937. We're viewing the white marble sculpture created by Mary Edmonia Lewis in the year 1866. Mary Edmonia Lewis lived a very interesting life. She was born in upstate New York, supposedly for uh, having an uh, African-American father and a Chippewa Indian mother. When she was in high school at Oberlin University in the 1850s, she was embroiled in a controversy in which she was accused of poisoning her roommates. Later, after dropping out of, uh, out of, out of high school, she wound up in Boston in which she studied uh, marble sculpture. And uh, after the Civil War, she moved to Rome, Italy, where this uh, piece was created in the year 1866. The Wooing of Hiawatha was based on the Longfellow poem, The Song of Hiawatha. Many artists were doing works based on this poem uh, during this time after. It was a very popular theme for artists to work on. You will find at least two other versions of the same wooing of Hiawatha under the name the old Indian arrow maker and his daughter. Uh, however, it's believed that this is the first because she carved it, this title into the base of the uh, sculpture. She did many uh, other themes on uh, the song of Hiawatha. Uh, for instance, also in this gallery, the marriage of Hiawatha and many others because of her Native American background, uh, she did many sculptures based on her heritage. It's probably fair to say that the artists of the Harlem Renaissance until recently were less well known than the poets, the writers, and the mu musicians. But even so, the small group that was working there established a way of working that predominated in African American art through the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s. They chose to depict themselves, following the writings of intellectuals like W.E.B. Du Bois and Elaine Locke, they chose to look at ordinary African Americans doing ordinary things in their daily lives. By doing so, they intended to counteract the racist stereotypes that they saw all around them. Jacob Lawrence was one of the most significant artists to come out of the Harlem Renaissance, and he was also one of the youngest 
uh, born in 1917. He was still in his early 20s when the 1930s came to a close. Um, I'm always impressed by his ability to simplify form and still have it carry great human meaning. He was one of the great storytellers. He's best known for some of the great epic stories that he told, Frederick Douglass, uh, Toussaint Louverture, th th things that look back in the African-American e experience. Um, th in this work here, though, uh, Wounded Man, there isn't a specific story, I would guess, looking at it, the, the form of that individual looking back over his shoulder with the, the, the wound in his side, significantly perhaps the same place that uh, Jesus on the cross was stabbed by the, uh, by the soldier, perhaps it's, it's a runaway slave and is referring back to that era, to the mid-19th century. But on the other hand, the date is 1968, so uh, it's not unlikely that Lawrence was actually uh, pointing this, pa uh, this picture towards the ongoing struggle for racial equality that was so characteristic of the 1960s. Still Life with Chrysanthemums was painted by the artist Palmer Hayden in 1938. It refers to the ordinary activities in which we all participate daily, such as gathering flowers. Here we see yellow gold chrysanthemums combined with brown oak leaves and red apples to celebrate the autumn season. Light enters the painting at the front of the composition and creates a white spot on the wall. It also makes a highlight on the blue vase and blurs the floral motifs of the tablecloth. The painting demonstrates Hayden's knowledge of impressionist techniques through his analysis of the effects of light and his application of thick brush strokes. Reviewing a work of art that I had commissioned by Elizabeth Catlett in 1984, I asked her to create a work of art for me based on uh, her friendship and knowledge of black women poets. And she created this work called Homage to Black Women Poets. I had known that she was the roommate and friend of Margaret Walker, the great poet, and I also knew that she knew uh, Margaret Burroughs and was also a friend of Gwendolyn Brooks. These were all friends of mine, and I had invited Margaret Walker to Detroit on several occasions. So she came up with this work of art made out of Mexican mahogany. While creating the work of art, in, at her home in Cuernavaca, Mexico, where she had lived since the late 1940s. I went down to visit her on several occasions and uh, actually saw the progress of the work being done. You're viewing the pen and egg drawing by Aaron Douglas done in 1941 called A Negro Speaks of Rivers. This drawing was done based on the poem by Langston Hughes. In fact, this painting or drawing was given to Langston Hughes after it was created, uh, based on the Hughes poem that was created in about 1923. Uh, this was Hughes's, one of Hughes's earliest poems and one of his most lasting poems and became his most uh, famous poem. It speaks of I've known rivers mighty rivers, and it speaks of the Euphrates, the Mississippi, the um, Congo, and the Nile, and all of these are depicted in this painting which was done many years later. I acquired this painting from one of the ladies who had one time worked with Langston Hughes uh, many years after Hughes and uh, Douglas had died. Um, so. I'm the second owner of this painting after Langston Hughes. Aaron Douglas was born in Topeka, Kansas in 1899. Uh, he received his Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the University of Nebraska. He found his way to New York during the Harlem Renaissance era and became probably the most influential artist during that era. He was a graphic designer and did many works for the Crisis Magazine and for the Opportunity Magazine. Mm -hmm. Uh, hired by W.B. Du Bois and Charles S. Johnson. He was heavily influenced by Wynold Rice 
and uh, went on to become uh, known for the style, the Art Deco style that you see represented in this drawing. Life, love, death, creation, these are universal themes and just about everybody thinks about the human condition. Ritual and spirituality have always been central to the African-American condition. R from ritual and spirituality comes the strength to endure, the strength to overcome. And the artists of the African-American world have depicted these qualities in much of their art. Jacob Lawrence was born in Atlantic City in 1917. He moved to Philadelphia for a couple of years before moving to Harlem when he was uh, 13 years old. It was in Harlem where he received his early art training in a community art, uh, a community workshop called Utopia House. Later, he received some formal training from Augusta Savage, uh, who worked for the WPA and taught for that uh, organization uh, during those years. Early in Lawrence's career, he began painting in series. In other words, he was a narrative painter. Uh, for instance, his most critical uh, series was the Migration Series, which depicted the migration of the Negro from the South to the North during the 20s and 30s. Uh, this series received widespread attention and was printed in Fortune magazine. Uh, it was also purchased, uh, the odd numbers were purchased by the uh, Phillips Museum in Washington, D.C., and the even numbers were purchased by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. There were a total of 60 panels in this series. What we're seeing here in this um, series is the Genesis series, which Jacob created during the 1980s. Reviewing number seven of eight of the Genesis series, and God created man and woman. Jake painted, uh, he considered this one painting. All eight paintings would be one. First he would put in the red colors, then he would put in the blue colors, and he mostly worked in primary colors. He also had uh, symbols, such as the toolbox that we see here, and the vase that we see here. And I once asked Jake, why is there no flower vase in panel number six. And he said it just didn't fit aesthetically. I also asked him what was the meaning of the toolbox. And he just said that it was his respectful workers that um, he created uh, and placed a toolbox in each one of these paintings. But you might note that from the 70s on, he had many uh, paintings that referred to builder series and uh, had toolboxes in most of the paintings that he created from the 70s on to his death in the year 2000. Aaron Douglas's paintings are masterpieces of simplification. He combines figurative and abstract forms, and he draws upon the bold contours of African art and the elegant simplicity of ancient Egyptian art. In this particular piece here, he's illustrating a poem called The Creation by James Weldon Johnson. And it, it, you can see here the, the rainbow, uh, this figure standing here, and these, this sequence of circles represents the moon that, um, in the words of the poet, as God flung it against the darkness. When European artists at the beginning of the 20th century discovered sub-Saharan African art, the masks in particular, it had a radical effect on their work. We all know about Picasso's cubism, but it was also a step on the way to abstraction, pure abstraction in painting and in sculpture. And abstraction, in fact, became quite a common mode for artistic expression in the first half of the 20th century. African-American artists, of course, also turned to Africa for experience, but for various reasons, they generally found 
that figurative art was more useful for the kinds of stories they had to tell. But after World War II, when New York became the center of, of the world um, art world, uh, abstraction really dominated through the efforts of the abstract expressionists. And at the same time, African-American artists turned to abstraction and discovered a whole new world for their self-expression. In 1983, I asked Richard Hunt to do this sculpture for me. It was commissioned based on the writings of writer Richard Wright. And what he came up with was this bridge. Hunt is known as an organic sculptor. In other words, much of his form comes from nature. Here you see the organically formed part over here along with a solidly based form over here. And he joins them together and forms a bridge. That portion of this work comes from a phrase in American Hunger, which was published by Wright posthumously, in which Wright states that if I cannot bring the races together as a bridge, then my life has been in vain. The word abstraction has a number of meanings. Uh, one is that the, the artist takes pure forms and arranges them in one way or another. Another form of abstra abstraction is taking a recognizable form and then gradually working with it, distorting it, simplifying it. It's that kind of abstraction that we see here in this Sergeant Claude Johnson painting uh, called Cubist Bird, uh, referencing, of course, the Cubist work of people like Picasso earlier in the 20th century. But here, uh, Johnson has taken the shape of the bird and spread it and repeated it um, so that it almost takes on the, the quality of a score of music. It seems to evoke the sense of the bird, uh, the bird song itself. And then, of course, these wonderful, brilliant colors, this stained glass brilliance comes from the technique, a very unusual technique of enameling, whereby you sprinkle the pigment um, onto the metal uh, plate that supports this work of art, and then you essentially cook it. It bakes, and, and the, the, the pigment fuses together, and you get this extraordinary jewel-like effect. There is no doubt that jazz is one of African America's great gifts to the world. So it should come as no surprise that African-American artists have turned to the world of jazz in particular, and music in general, as a source of deep inspiration. In this final gallery, all five paintings were inspired by the music art form. And in this particular case, the piano lesson by Romir Bearden August Wilson, the playwright, was inspired to write the play, The Piano Lesson. Bearden himself got the inspiration from Mary Lou Williams, uh, who was from Pittsburgh, um, who was not only a pianist, a fine pianist, but also a piano instructor. Bearden at one time lived in Pittsburgh himself, so was, there was that Pittsburgh connection, as August Wilson, who uh, lived in Pittsburgh at one time. And the Blues Has Got Me, a 1944 watercolor by Romir Bearden. Bearden uses the Cubist technique to depict his blues of jazz musicians. In Jazz Rhapsody, a commission that I asked Bearden to do for me for an album cover, he uses the collage technique. In another painting by Buford Delaney, Ella Fitzgerald, the expatriate Buford Delaney uh, would have known Ella Fitzgerald and would have seen her performing on many occasions. We acquired this painting in Paris where Buford Delaney spent his last years and died. In the final painting in this gallery, a uh, painting by Fred Jones, Enamel on Copper, we have a very unique technique in which he p depicts two New Orleans jazz musicians. This was also a commission done for an album cover. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of In the Frame, exploring the art of African America as seen through the collection of Walter Evans. You can get up-to-date information on the DIA at dia.org. Until next time, this is Graham Beale, your guide to one of America's great museums, the Detroit Institute of Arts.
Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products.